My own desire, our own desires can destroy us. To want something too bad, that which is unattainable, to, to go for it, to challenge and chase it yeah. becomes, it, you can be driven to the extent where you actually damage the product. And because this coach watched my every move, if he saw me stumble on lifting weights, if he saw me run and my hands, my body language gave, I have no idea what I was doing, but my body language said everything. And he could pick up on all the signs of me struggling, of me um, performing well, and he then wanted to create a pattern. And that was the code. P create a pattern that allowed me to perform, and once I performed at a level, not full out, not flat out, a controlled level, at first that became, that became hard, and then it became easier, and then became natural. And now I could even train harder. But the point was, I had to have these maps built into me to understand the levels in which I'm training at. And they go in all directions, psychology, uh, the spiritual, your body language, the efforts, something new, something done over years. All this matters. And he was able to simply guide me. So when I won my first championships, I, I asked myself, how have I done this? I'm on my eighth fight and I've knocked out this champion and, and I'm the schoolboy champion of Derbyshire and I'm thinking, I still ask myself, walking back to the dressing room, how, how did, how, is this a dream? And it was this man manipulating every move I did and building trust. And whereas I would look at him and call him a father figure. And whatever he told me to do, I would do. Something ridiculous happened. Um, I was training for about a year and people were coming into the gym similar to that two week episode that I had to go through. Yeah. Because at this point I didn't think I was that good. Don't ask me why. I knew I was good, but I didn't know I was... But my logic was, how come I'm always sparring the bigger guys? So I was at 12, I was sparring, 13, I was sparring the 18, I was sparring the middleweights, uh, the headlight heavyweights. I didn't realize it was because I was heavy handed. I didn't know all that. And I'd come out, they'd hit me with a jab, and it hurt, because they're big men in my eyes, they had moustaches. <laughs> so they were men to me. You know what I mean? And Floyd Davidson, a great champion of our, our gym at the time, and I'm going kidding, I had to be in the ring with him. And I was coming out bruised up, and I'd go home, my dad would go, what's happened to your face? I'm going, uh, yeah, I got hit. And he was getting angry with that, so I wasn't getting encouraged at home. They wanted me to pack in, my mum loved it. <laughs> she wanted me to box, but my dad was like dead against it. So I was kind of, I was kind of struggling. In, in, in that department. So when I went into the championships, my first fight was against, should have been against a one fight victory and maybe he's had two fights and it's my first fight. See, that, you would never get in a ring with someone who's had 18 fights and he's a Staffordshire champion. And and it's my first fight because I may look okay in the gym. So they trained me for a year in the gym now, I remember that. They trained me for a year and people had come in and got registered in six weeks. People would come in, three months had been registered. And I was still there a year later, not being registered. And then I got upset, I said, why have I not been registered? I'm beating him in sparring, I'm beating that guy on the runs, I'm fitting these guys, so I was protesting in my little kiddie way. Yeah. And the coach took me aside and went, because you, you, we think you can go further. These guys are enjoying boxing, we think at this moment you could go further. And I thought, oh, oh okay. <laughs> and the next thing, when I did have a fight, I didn't want to fight. I had tummy ache, I had belly ache, I didn't want to turn up, I starved all day, I didn't want to make the weight, I didn't want to do it, and I thought, you know what, I don't want to fight. And then and not even warming up and going into this fight against the Staffordshire champion. No one told me the Staffordshire champion. It was until afterwards I beat him and I stopped in the second round and it was in the paper. I got the write-up today and I look at it thinking, that's crazy stuff, you don't do that with people. Because now I couldn't get any fights with people my own age. Because people would say, uh, no, one fight, Staffordshire, nah, I'm not going near you. And then straight away, that's why I got shoved into championships. And then I went on to win the, the scoreboard champion. I had one coach that seemed to get a buzz out of taking me to gyms and having me, as I would look at it, mangle other fighters up. And I dropped them in sparring. I got to the stage where I couldn't get sparring anymore. And I'm sort of a kid mentally. And everywhere I'd go to a gym, I'd always be boxing their best kids which frustrated me a little bit. And I was always very respectful. I would never initially go out to knock someone out. I would never lose control, but I was doing it. And I was just dropping people. And, and 
So it was, that had to be controlled. And my coach, Mickey, the main coach who, who mentored me basically, he was aware of this. So he'd never let me spar any of the guys in the gym. And I think at one point that bully, Dean Gower came in and he was wanting to spar me all the time. Get coming into the gym. And um, I got to the stage where I can't spar people and I'm hurting my friends and I wasn't meaning to and I didn't know how to handle it. I remember my mum saying something to me years ago when I was a youngster. I was um, I was wrestling with her, I was about six or seven. I was wrestling with my mum, fighting my mum, wrestling with her. And she kept saying, oh God, you don't know your own strength, stop it. And I was like, I thought I felt cool, I'm strong. And it wasn't until the next day I seen these massive bruises on her arm where I'd gripped her. And I could think she used to mock up easy, but it looked horrific. And I was mortified that I'd hurt my mum. And I understood what she meant now by, you don't know your strength. And in boxing terms, the energy level when we hit each other, we don't know what kind of shot we throw. Because remember, we're, we're fearful, we're afraid. We don't want to get hit in the face. So we react and respond accordingly. And, then, and so therefore, I would be hurting people because I was a physically strong kid for my age. And that's why they put me in the ring with older kids. And I didn't like that <laughs> because of older kids. And then I started to get a reputation. So when it came to training people with that kind of power and that kind of um, drive, I had to be monitored well. And Mickey allowed this. The other coaches just wanted to parade me up and down the country fighting. And they kept saying, we've got to stop this. Um, and I'd go to places and not be black. And the only time I actually learned how to hold my punch back, and I understood, is when I got a boxer guy called Clive Machen. He'd be 22 and I'd be 15. And I just watched the Sugar Ray Leonard fight. So I was boosting. I was, I was on the high, on hyperdrive. I'd watch Sugar Ray Leonard box uh, a fighter. And it's like watching a Rocky film. When you watch a Rocky film, the gym next day is full. On Sugar Ray Box, the gym was full. Everybody came out from nowhere and we're hyped up. And I remember this guy, he threw a really, uh, an obvious jab. And I used to slip it easy and I slipped and threw a left uppercut. And I watched him drop in front of me. And I thought, at that point was the last time I ever threw a punch with any, no control over it or any flash behind it. And I'm not saying I haven't gone heavy in spine with some people, but sometimes you have to. But I never threw a shot that way again. I realized then, I am strong, I do hit. And that's when I kind of got the maturity to realize I can't now be like a kid anymore throwing shots with this kind of power. And that made me realize that's when I, the boxing then started to develop. I then tried to mimic Sugar Ray Leonard and watch his boxing ability, not the scrapping version. I call it Roberto Duran. I thought I was Roberto Duran at one point. <laughs> I think Muhammad Ali obviously influenced me uh, not at the beginning, but as I've got to know, reading the book on Life and Times of Muhammad Ali by Thomas Hauser, amazing book, amazing read, and what he's done outside of boxing. Because you don't realise that when you're, when you're a child, you just it's just boxing. There is no outside of that. And, and, and you're channelled and you're focused. And um, So I didn't really know Ali to that. I'd seen him with my dad watching Ali and I didn't really understand the boxing then, but Sugar Ray, the first time I, I saw Sugar Ray and Roberto Duran, that was my first real experience of a fight. I didn't know what professional boxing was, I didn't know what amateur boxing was, all I remember, I always say this story, I remember we had a TV that when he switched it on, the volume would come straight on, but the picture would take about an eternity to come on. And I remember putting it on a Wednesday night, Dickie Davis, I think it was, the show went on and it was like, these two fighters, they've been keeping this up now for 12 rounds. What keeps them up? How did they start? What is this? I thought it was wrestling. What's this? And I was like, come on, come on, come on, what's this picture? Come on. And then all of a sudden, this picture came into light. And then these two warriors were just, in my eyes at that time, we just didn't back down. They were just flawless. They were just knocking the bejesus out of each other. It was incredible. A bit of style. And they weren't getting hit clean. And they were ducking. And there was taking shots to the body, and I thought, what the hell is this? And then the man went, they're doing this for $6.2 million. I went, ah, <laughs> you get paid for this too. <laughs> and then, then, I, then I was showing, when Sugar Ray lost the fight, I was gutted. And then I watched Sugar Ray's rematch, and I saw him, he was versatile, how he spoke after the fight, how he carried himself, and then the, the rematch, and, and I know 
other things that went on behind the scene, which is what mars that in my life in boxing, the politics and how they can influence it. But in our eyes as kids, the rematch, Sugar Ray then became the boxer. And he totally changed everything. He changed his tactics. And I was like, that's what I want to be, versatile. I want to be able to do both, fight and box with that kind of caliber. And that's, I then became Sugar Ray Leonard. Neville Brown, 22 years old, from the Burton Club in the Midlands. And he's champion of the Midlands for the third year running, Brown. England international, European bronze medalist in Italy last summer. Had an absolutely brilliant career, both as junior and senior.